Amen. The book of James. Hasn't it been a great book? Amen. This book not only is filled with wisdom, I like to call it the, the Proverbs of the New Testament, but also was written before a lot of the other epistles in the New Testament. It was written about 45 A.D. So the church was just getting started in Jerusalem. Uh, Pastor James was just ready to preach. And, you know, there was a lot of persecution going on. Remember, these guys were scattered abroad in Palestine. And so they were panicked. And, you know, you and I, we have good teaching. We have a Bible. It's full of 66 books, Old Testament, 39, New Testament, 27. And it's filled with wisdom and knowledge. But back then, they only had scrolls and what they shared with each other. And so God had to use them mightily in that. So they did not have very much understanding about being indwelt by God. Remember, they had a Jewish mindset. And so these Jewish people knew about the wisdom of God. They knew about the wisdom of Solomon. They knew about patience. They knew about all these things. But remember, they're trying to follow God by the outward man. Remember, the law was given to tell us we can't save ourselves, right? And to open our eyes to we need somebody to help us like the Messiah that's coming. Amen. So this book again, what a blessing. And God said the people that are wise are the ones that hear his sayings and does them. Remember what he said? I will liken unto a wise man, he that hear my sayings and does them. He's like when the winds blow and the floods beat upon that house and cannot shake it because it's founded on a rock. And we shared with you before, remember, about the Israelites, how that the, the rock followed them and provided water for them. And that rock was Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It talks about it in there. But see, what you don't know is also that rock was the foundation for their feet as they walked through the wilderness, as they came through the desert. And in the New Testament, who's in our heart? Jesus. Who, who, what are we reading right here? We're reading the Word of God. And the Word of God, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God, right? So we're reading God. God is speaking to us through the Word of His page. It will not return unto them void. So it's, it's exciting. So as we hear the word and do it, that's why we want to teach you just all kinds of things, hoping that you'll retain a lot of it. So you want it. you'll get a, a certain portion by hearing it tonight. Hopefully you'll play it again tomorrow, take some notes. You know, I would encourage you not to take any notes tonight because I'm going to read them. And then if you can, listen to it again. You maybe put it in there your uh, YouTube file or something, and then take notes where you could pause it and really pull some of the jewels out of here. Now, I know it's me talking, and I know it's the word coming out of me, but it's the anointing. You can tell when I, when I speak, the anointing of God comes out of me. God bears witness because it's the truth. Can you say amen? And it would, same thing would happen to anybody else that shares the truth. So it's a great privilege to be able to share the word of God or God's word with you it is so powerful and such a great privilege. All right, so you open your Bibles to Romans 8, put your finger there, and then go to James chapter 4 if you're not already. You're supposed to be in James 4, but I, we're going to segue at the beginning and kind of give you a text to kind of set us up for tonight's lesson in Romans 8 verses 5 through 8. So again, don't, you can just write the address down. Don't try to look it up because sometimes when we look up scripture, we miss what's said. That's to hear it second time we can't. I think we have something coming out like that to help you learn. Is it out yet, honey? Okay, we need to get it out by maybe tomorrow or so. Okay, so, all right. Let's look at the review of the book. What have we learned in chapter one? Do you remember? What was one of the, or one, maybe one or two of the greatest Teachings that James brought out in chapter 1. Letting patience have a perfect work and become doers of the word and not hearers only. How about in chapter 2? Yeah, don't have respect for persons. And we can bring that down right on down to colors, classes of people, people that uh, who we judge to be this or that, which we shouldn't. 
Amen. And chapter 3. Do you remember what chapter 3 was about? Huh? About how the tongue is, could be really a blessing to us or it could be a real world of iniquity. <laughs> so it is among our members that we want to make sure. What I try to do, and I, I mean, again, I'm human. But what I try to do is when I have my morning devotionals with God and lay my body out as a living sacrifice, I ask God to work with the little quirks that I have, the little idiosyncrasies, the little, the little troubling things that I often slip at, you know, like making a statement or get frustrated about something. I mean, these are not terrible sins, but these are something that I don't want to carry with me all the time. Well, I, I want God to be able to, with his divine marination, marinating me to pull out and soften that hardness in my life. So I like to be with God. I mean, I tell God, is I love waking up in him. I love waking up with him. And me and God, we just have a Kleenex festival, you know, sobbing and worshiping and, and telling them and talking about the things that are on our hearts. And God's talking to me and sharing. And you say, wow, Pastor Gray, I wish I could have something like that. Well, you can't. Maybe you're young yet. Maybe you haven't developed that yet. So let me encourage you. You can Go back some history, about four or five months, I, I did a session on how to do it in the morning, how to talk with God, some of the basic things you could cover. Amen. So, all right, you got Romans chapter 8 for our pretext of the text. Okay, amen. We're going to be talking about the carnal mind because, as you see in chapter 4, it's going to come right out of the, of the gate. Why is there wars and, and fighting among you, he's going to say, see? Now, you've got to remember that the Jewish people, I told you, I think I told you last week, that you could go in Jerusalem or any major, Tel Aviv for one, and you could go right down into the city, and about every four or five blocks is a synagogue. And there's a synagogue here, it's kind of, and the synagogue, both four or five blocks down there and everything, and they all have different leaders in the synagogue, like different churches, right? And in the synagogue, if you've never been to one, they get up, they read the scripture, and then they argue it. Now, the reason why we're seeing some of this come out in the book of James is that they would argue scripture. So you would go four blocks to your relatives down in Tel Aviv, and they're going to a different synagogue with a different teacher, and they would argue, and we'd have dinner and argue over all the things. So the Jewish people, whether you know it or not, they're beautiful people, by the way. There's this trying to follow God by the physical works. Remember? And Jesus said to them about the parable of the sower. He says, because you've allowed sin in your life, your hearts have gotten hardened. Your eyes don't see anymore. And your ears can't hear what I'm saying. Lest any time you see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and repent. And I should heal you. You see. So there's two of us. Remember the Jewish people didn't realize that God was dwelling in them now. They thought God was just around them. But God was dwelling in them. Also they didn't know what you and I know. That there's two of us. They're the old man and the new man. So they thought the whole package. Kind of like some Christians do. When their old man acts up, they go, oh, God, why did I do that? Instead of putting the old man on the plate first thing in the morning so it doesn't act up. Hello? It's getting quiet in here. Ding, 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 ding. Because the Bible says if you know to do that and you don't do that, you're sinning. We'll get to that part later on in this lesson tonight. But anyway, I want you to know that sometimes when we see something and we go, oh, Man, I've been doing that. That's when God says, okay, it's time to work on that. God's not going to give you any guilt or condemnation. He says, okay, now you see that you are missing something. Now we can deal with it, son or daughter. If you don't know you have a problem, God can't deal with it because you can't out invite him in because you don't know you got a problem. problem is, the, the, the funny situation about that is everybody else knows but you haven't figured it out. It could be kind of funny, couldn't it? Come on, don't give me that tone of voice looking at me that way. Anyway, so let's go on. 
So Romans chapter 5, listen to what it says. For those who live according to the flesh. See, that would be the old man. You could be a Christian and live like the world. See, that's what he's saying right here. For those that live according to the flesh set their mind. Their mind is occupied on the things of the flesh. But those that live according to the Spirit, because they're around the Spirit, they're talking the Spirit, talking the Word, they're doing the best that they can, um, they, talk, they, they talk about the things of the Spirit. Let me read it again. But those that live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Six. For to be carnally minded. Best way I know to explain that. Carnal means, means meat or it means fleshly minded. Okay? Flesh, meat, flesh, meat. And, and, and some people call people meatheads. Don't call people names. But a fleshly minded person is simply a meathead. That's really, really they are. They're, in other words, their thinking, the things that they think about, is all based on how they feel, how they do things, how they want to impress others. So you can see that's kind of carnal thinking. Say, oh, me. That's you. God can help you. <laughs> all right. So let's go on. So to be carnal minded is death. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. You see the correlation? Which one do you want? Because the carnal mind, the old man thinking, is enmity against God. Enmity means creates division, creates division. You know, the Bible says in uh, Romans 16, you know, mark those that cause division among you. Division is something that divides us up or divides somebody's um, belief system up. It'd be a terrible thing, like say, for example, that you just got saved, but you got some crazy ideas for me to attack the crazy ideas and not encourage you just got saved. You don't hit people's foundation, even if there's a few pebbles in the way there. You don't yank the rug out from where they're walking. You encourage their walk and you say amen. You don't correct their sloppiness. Hello. Oh, I love to come to school because my, my teacher's constantly pointing out my, my faults in front of the class. Well, no, that's not fun. So let's go on. So because the carnal mind separates, fights against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Hear that phrase? Nor indeed can it be. Had some people ask me all the time, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing this? What am I doing wrong? Hey, stop concentrating on what you're doing wrong. Start concentrating on what you're doing right and do more of it. See, the enemy's got you looking at yourself trying to figure things out. Can't you see he's moved you from the faith realm into the reasoning realm? Someone say amen. And when we get into that reasoning realm, remember Satan's been messing with people's heads for thousands of years. What makes you think you can outthink the devil, bunky? You cannot. That's why God says you follow him by faith from your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. Let God order your steps for the day and follow them. Then he'll give you plenty of room to play. Follow his steps in the day, and you'll have plenty of time to play. People that do the work asked by God have plenty of grace to enjoy God. Can you say amen? He's not building workaholics. <laughs> He's building laborers or love. Amen. So let's go on past that. All right. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So that's why, you know, when I got a hold of this, I mean, years ago, I mean, I would have my times. I mean, the pressures would come and the things would go, and I'd be there praying, oh, God, can you do this? Can, can you do this? You know this, and God would interrupt me, and he'd tell me I was complaining rather than asking him to really get involved. And now, do you know what it is now? It says, Carrie... When you're spending time with me, don't occupy during the day your mind of why people are doing the dumb things they're doing. Don't occupy your mind on why people are doing or not doing things. Occupy your mind on me and my word. Amen. Someone say amen. amen. 
because our mind's a precious thing. We don't want to have a lot of stuff sitting on our mind. The Bible says cast our care over on the Lord, doesn't it? We're going to get to that scripture tonight. So let me go on. I'm, I'm stopping too much. I want to get through all of this tonight. But it says, so then those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you are not in the flesh. Say I'm not, but in the spirit if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. So we're born again, so we're really in the spirit. But you can catch yourself when you start to slide off into the flesh. Come on now. And remember the Jewish mindset. These people, beautiful Christian Jewish people, had no revelation of what that was. So they'd argue and fight and scream and yell. And you know when some people get under pressures of life? I mean, they're at each other's throat, God forbid. They're blaming each other. You were handling the books. You messed that up. And you were doing this. And how come you didn't get this done? You've been promised me weeks you would do that, you know. You know, this kind of stuff. Wars and fighting amongst you. All right, so I remember I was setting this up for the beginning of James chapter 4. All right, so then it says, I got a few points underneath that. Point one, when we live in the realm of our fleshly senses and our desires, our minds become filled with that very kind of thinking. I call it sometimes even people that are, they expect handouts all the time. Or they have a victim. And, oh, poor me. People are treating me bad, treating me bad. Hey, the devil will take your lights out, Bunky. You better straighten up, go to God. You quit feeling sorry for yourself. Quit running around being a wishbone and get some backbone. Can you say amen? Two, those who live in the spirit... Their minds are occupied with spiritual things. Was it saying, Colossians 3, set your mind on things above and not things on the earth? Amen? All right. So, amen. For your life, for you're dead, your life's hidden in Christ, in God. Yay. And then thirdly, our mind, when it's saturated with a carnal lifestyle, will never please God. There's Christians, got a beer in their hand, a joint in their hand. I'm not putting anybody down. And they're just cussing and they're And then they'll come to church and they'll act like nobody knows anything. Well, God knows everything. And so it's not a question of that. And eventually the devil will keep them from coming to church because they feel that everybody knows. Remember, Satan will do everything that he can to keep you out of the word, keep you out of your prayer in the morning, out of your time of fellowshipping, with God, interacting with him throughout the day. Why? Because you'll drive him nuts. The devil loses every time when you have a lifestyle like that. He just can't handle it. And a lot of people, they think, well, well, then he's going to attack me and make my life miserable. He can't. It has to come through God to get to you. You see, we've got screwed up thinking. We're not piecing this puzzle together. And you, you wait. You get yourself on a cancer line or in some hospital situation, and there is no atheist there. They're all crying out for God. Well, let's not get into that situation. Let's seek God and keep us healthy. Can you say amen? Kind of a weak amen, but say amen. amen. The Bible says the word of God is medicine to all our flesh. It's the only thing that we can take that can operate and heal any part of our flesh, our mind, our toe, hello, cancer. But we got to get into it. You got to know what it says. When you get an ache and a pain, why don't you tell the word? Why don't you tell a, you know, speak the word at it? But we don't. We go running for the medicine cabinet, which we can run to the medicine cabinet in Jesus' name and take the pill in Jesus' name. That's okay. But why, instead of get up, pray first? Moving right along. So our mind, if it's saturated with the carnal, will have a carnal thinking. And if it's saturated with the spirit, amen, it will cause us to think spiritual things. Somebody said one time, and I used to say this, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. What they meant is, don't be an airhead. But that's not the way you say it. Just don't be an airhead. But heavenly-minded people are hanging out with God. He has all the answers. 
Hello? He has all that. You think you're a good something or other? He'll, he'll make your head spin, showing you how to do it. Why don't you ask him how to do it better? Hey, going out, I'm painting. I'm doing a lot of painting. And you know what God's telling me about painting and doing all, showing me how to mix paint and make colors. And, man, I'm having a blast. Oh, God, when he's more into saving the loss and all that. No, he isn't. You're his kid. And there's so much of God everywhere. He wants to be so personal with you. He truly wants you to be fathered. He truly wants to father us. And we've got to let him. Can you say amen? That means there's a little bit of correction that goes along with dad. Can you say amen? He's Abba father. He's Abba, my daddy, and he's my father. Very authoritative. Don't mess up. The fear of the Lord's the beginning of wisdom. Don't take God for granted. Say amen. All right. So my first point, James chapter 4 now, pride or self promotes strife. People that are in pride or people that are in the flesh are always fighting and arguing. If you got a marriage like that, quit. Don't quit the marriage. So <laughs> I'm not saying that part. <laughs> you see, two people are arguing and one does, refuses to argue. You don't have an argument. All right, James chapter 4. Look at verse 1 through 6. All right. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have. Now remember, he's not talking to you. He's talking to these Jewish people who haven't got much understanding of who God is in them. And so they're acting like a typical Jew that wants to argue all the time and fight. You know, a little name calling, you know. And so he says, you lust and you do not have, verse 2, you murder and cover and cannot, and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and you war. Now, you see the word murder there? That could lead all the way to taking somebody's life. But, you know, there's a lot of people taking somebody's credibility and they're making character assassinations. I mean, people get up, they don't like your company, they'll get up on the internet, have a whole bunch of their friends, just give a bunch of negative reports and stuff like that. It's called murder in the spirit. It's character assassination. Did you hear about so-and-so? They're a so-and-so. It's murder. It's, a, it's assassination. And these people didn't think anything of that. And yet, we bring curses upon ourselves because as a man soweth, so shall he reap. So let's read it again. Where do wars and fights come among you? Do they not come because your desires for pleasure that you war in your members? You're not even settled within yourself. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet, cannot uh, obtain. You fight, you war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Now, if you put all that in context, it means if you want forgiveness, you got to ask forgiveness. If you want to get that out of your life, the warring and the fighting and the arguing, you got to ask God to cleanse it out of your life. Can you say amen? You can't run around thinking just because you're Jew, just because you're a Christian, God's going to automatically start working on you. No, you got to ask. You have not because you ask not. And every day, every morning, you got to ask because you have a will that whether you know it or not, sometimes repels God. You, your wife might say to you, your husband might say to you, and your will gets in and says, no, I'm not going to do that. See, there you go, see? We want to get those things under the blood. We want Jesus removing those things from us because we want to score high when we stand before the great, excuse me, the, the, the judgment seat of Christ. It says we will give an account of the things that we said and done, whether good or or bad. So let's get the slate clean. <laughs> and so Pastor James is talking to these Jewish people. And he says, look, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss. Anybody here got a different translation? You ask it upon your lusts and your desires. 
your carnal man is asking. God, if you gave me a new Cadillac, I'll bet you I'll be a better person. Lord, can I trade in my old wife for a new one? <laughs> Hello, I'm just being goofy with you. Are you with me? So, and then it goes, do you not know that friendship, I love this, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity, remember division with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Wow, that's pretty plain. So these Jewish people, they thought that God was really favoring them if everything went their way. Now there's some Christians who believe that silly stuff. If everything's going your way, I'd be looking, you know, for the enemy coming. Hello? If everything's in ease, don't have the second bowl of cereal, Bunky. Everything starts to mellow out and you kick back and it starts to work for you. Don't go backsliding back into your old dumb ways. You know, you're losing weight, continue to lose. If the doctor said to you, lose weight or you're going to die, you better lose weight every week. And it better be the highest priority next to God to you. If God says you better quit smoking or you're going to die of cancer and it's serious and God says now it's time to quit, well, then we need to be listening to God. Hello? Instead of going on like, hey, everything's just going to be God, which is great. And that's how we get into trouble. We assume because everything else is going pretty good. Yeah, but what was the original thing God said? I want you to work on that. And we're not. So, this is the problem with the Jewish people. They've got a little bit of the word, but they're practicing the old ways of the carnality. Are you still with me? Okay. He calls them in verse 4, listen to this, adulterers, adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is the enemy of God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. God is a jealous God. He doesn't want to share. If you gave your life to him and you're his kids, he doesn't want some stranger, stranger danger, taking you and corrupting you, getting you back on drugs or doing whatever with you. Why? That's because you don't know to discern good from evil. And they really didn't at this time. They were just panicked. So listen as he goes on. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain that the spirit who dwells in us, see, remember they didn't have the revelation. So Pastor James says, you know, the spirit dwells in us, yearns jealously, that he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So he's trying to say, hey, you, you Jewish people, stop thinking because you're Jewish that you got an automatic ticket to heaven. You don't. And because your mom was a Christian, your dad was a Christian, and they dedicated you to the Lord, if you haven't gotten born again, then you just think you're a Christian. You've got to make a personal peace with God yourself individually and know that God has granted your forgiveness. You can't just run around and say, well, I'm an American, thinking that means Christian. You know, and if you got a garage, you walk into your garage, you don't become a car. Huh? You go into McDonald's, you don't become a hamburger. Or do you? <laughs> Maybe I ought to stay away from there. All right, so let's move on. A couple of points after this. Number one, fighting and wars come from our fleshly desires for pleasure. I remember back in those days. These desires war in us and cause uneasiness. For example, remember what turned Lot's wife around? It's her longing for the sin life. Hello. What made the Israelites say in the middle of the wilderness, would that we go back to Egypt rather than die out here in the wilderness? No trust in God. What were wrong with these Jewish Mindset born-again Christians, they're freaking out. No trust in God. Instead, they're blaming everybody. 
So you Gentiles, you know, whatever. Okay, so he goes on. Number two, the flesh causes us to speak against others, against leadership. Causes us to murder people's character, character assassination. We fight in war. Our prayers then are hindered. And that's exactly what Satan wants. If you, husband and wife, are fighting and you don't resolve it, you might as well stop praying unless it is God help me to just let this go. Because the fighting and the strife and everything is where Satan gathers. He gathers in that and he actually shows up. So the more you fight and argue, the more he manifests. And when he manifests, the worse it gets. Hello? So rather than do that, we bring God in every morning. Can you say amen? Husbands and wives pray together. First thing today, we pray. Pray together. So each one, you know you're on what page you're on. If you're going to go somewhere, tell your wife, tell your husband. Don't just get in the car, drive off, and don't be several hours late with a stupid excuse saying, you know, it just happened. Come on. I'm talking to somebody tonight. I don't know who. You know, but if you don't wiggle around, then I won't find out who. Okay. <laughs> Holy Spirit gets our numbers, folks. You got to realize, everybody says, who's been calling the pastor and letting them know? Well, nobody. I've been sitting with God. God loves this congregation. He loves you guys. And he's going to let me in on what to say that might help you. As long as I'm not calling your number and drilling you on with one of these dentist drills. Can you say amen? Thirdly, when you pray, it's for selfish reasons. That's what called praying amiss is. You pray for selfish reasons. But you might even have the wrong motives. God, get them, you know? All right, and then fourthly, God does not want us to get caught up in worldly ways. Now, folks, I'm going to say something. You might not like this, but there's a lot of these big churches that are seeker churches. And seeker churches, if they're seeking God, that's great. Well, once they find God, they need to go to a training church where they get trained up on their relationship with God. Because all you do if you just go to a secret church every Sunday is once you, you found Jesus, you're not seeking anymore. You found him. Now you walk with him. So you want to walk with him, church. To say amen. Because a lot of seek, um, secret churches do a lot of worldly things, and you kind of can't tell the difference. And so be cautioned on that. You know, listen, how are people going to find out that you love God if they can't hear it in you, can't see it in you? If you're looking and smelling like the world, I mean, how are they going to know? Say, oh, me, somebody. So God does want us to share our lives with the world. We are his, his, his chaste virgin. We are his children. And fifthly, God resists the proud and gives grace to the what? The humble. So, or do you not, the scriptures say in vain, all right? So, again, our mind is to not be saturated with silly things. All right, so let's go on down to verse 5. I didn't read verse 5, did I? Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in you yearns jealousy. He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, and this is the one I want us to really think about for a minute. God resists the what? Where would our pride be? In our spirit or our flesh? Okay, so should we hang out in the flesh too long? No, because it has what? Pride. And if pride is something God resists or gets away from, then no wonder it says, if any man be in the flesh, he cannot please God. He repels God. Repelling God. Now, what is the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost? Let me see if you get this. To blaspheme the Holy Ghost is to repel the Holy Ghost. So pride would do something like that, wouldn't it? I mean, ultimate pride would say no to Jesus and, and you don't ever accept him as your Lord and Savior. Wouldn't that be the epitome of pride? Yes, it would. And somebody who's prideful would say, 
well, I want this part of God, but I don't want that part of God. That would be prideful, wouldn't it? I'll, I'll get born again, but you don't, I don't want to speak in tongues. I guess a little prideful. Why don't you ask God if he wants you to? Hello. Oh, that's right. I did give my heart to God. Yeah. He does count, you know. You should be asking him for advice. You should go to him before you make any major decision and say, God, what do you think? Moving right along. All right. Okay, so he doesn't want to share us, so God resists the proud and gives grace and humble. Let's move down. I've got to turn my page. First Peter chapter 5 is an extra scripture. You stay, you stay in James. Now i got two hiccups. <laughs> Verses 5 through 7 in First Peter 5. Listen to this. You stay in James, okay? You'll, you'll pick up in verse 7 in James 4. But here, let me read this to you. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to the elders or the older people. Yes, all of you be submissive one to another. Listen to people and talk to people and be submissive one to another. And be clothed with humility. Everyone say humility. Why? For God resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So you putting your hand on your hips and saying, God's using me more than he's using you would be a bad thing to say, wouldn't you think? Of course, I just made it up, but sure it would. It, it's very prideful. What did Satan get thrown out of heaven with? He says, I will be, I will be, I'll be this, I'll do this, I'll do this. Get the I out of your conversation. Listen to yourself sometime. How many times do you say, I did this, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I did this, and I done this, and I did this. You need to uh, take a check and uh, kind of get a whole uh, handle on that because uh, you're going on probably mom and dad's grace still, and you need to develop some on your own. Hello. There's a lot of what I call second-generation Christians where mom and dad were saved, and they've just kind of glided on that. And they don't only surfacely and, and, and mentally acknowledge God, but as far as really being dedicated, and Satan just loves to pick those people off. That's, yeah, so here's another thing. Who did Satan come to in the garden? He came to the woman because she had an indirect relationship through her husband with God instead of having a personal, strong relationship herself. And God said, because you, Adam, listen to the voice of your wife, somebody less than experienced. So let, don't let people who don't know anything about the word try to tell you about God. You smile at them and say, here, let's sit down and let's look at the scripture together. Hello? Amen. I went to a Bible study years ago. My youth were, were being taken up by this particular person. And the person said this. She says, I'm beyond the Bible. She took the Bible, threw it on the floor. You know, I'm beyond the Bible. Hey, listen, no one's beyond the Bible because the Word of God is God. And no one gets beyond God. Sorry. So right there, I, I looked at her and I said, I will see her in about two weeks. She'll be completely, this will completely go away because you can't self-proclaim yourself to be somebody and not God, get God's goat about it because God resists the proud, gives grace to the so the best thing you and I can do, humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift us up. So I asked God some, some years back, I said, Lord, in this day and age we're living, how do you want me to be? And he says, humble. I said, be humble. Stay humble, talk humble, think humble, eat humble pie. Now, there's false humility. Oh, I'm so unworthy. I'll never amount. That is not what God's talking about. A humble person will simply say, you know, I'm in love with Jesus. I can see it. They just have no problem defending. They have to argue. Why? They're just humble. Can you say amen? And what did Adam do when God confronted him and said, have you eaten of the tree? What did Adam do? Was he humble? No. He said, it was the woman you gave me, God. He blamed both his wife and God for his dumb mistake. 
moving right along. So, yes, all of you be submissive one to another, clothed in humility, for God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves. See, our job is to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. God is never going to put you in a position you're not tough enough to occupy. Let me just tell you something. Have you ever heard me say this? I'm preaching you the truth. Satan's hearing me preach you the truth. And you better take it to heart because he's going to attack you like you believe what I'm telling you. And everybody goes, oh, come on, Pastor Kerry. No, it's the truth. What happened to Peter after he said to Jesus, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Satan came immediately and made his life hell. So you got to realize when God delivers the word to you, you've got to be responsible enough to study and find out what it's about. Have you got that on, um, on being balanced yet? Okay. I want that paragraph. All right. So, therefore, submit to God. This is verse 7 through 10. Therefore, submit to God in James. Resist the devil and he will what? Please. But you got to do what first? Yeah. No, you have to submit to God. <laughs> You're not going to do anything about your flesh. He's going to laugh at you. I've seen people who are completely wore out, going to fight, trying to fight the devil in the physical flesh. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We don't fight in, in you know, with, with natural things. We fight spiritually with Jesus. Can you say amen? Now listen to this. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil. You flee. What is your morning prayer about? Submitting to God. Then your whole day, the devil will, was, will literally run and flee from you. But you got to submit to God and get tanked up first. Amen. Well, I don't like to pray because I have a hard time talking. Well, pray in tongues. Hello. Stop blaming yourself. Get in and pray. Pray till you can't stand up. Try that. Guarantee you'll want to do that over and over again. Sometimes I'll pray and I can't get up out of the chair. It's so powerful. And I'm not trying to say or brag on anything. I'm just trying to say many of us are missing out because we have a form of religion and godliness, but we're not diving into the, to God and finding out stuff that we really need to find out and then going with that nature and presence on us into his word. Okay, so draw, then he says, draw near to me, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Sow, and you shall what? Reap. You make the first step, he makes the second. You just draw near, he draws near. Keep drawing near till you become one. Amen? Are you with me? So, and, and draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Lord, just cleanse me. You sinners, purify your hearts. You double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Boy, that sounds like a positive message. No, these guys were all full of themselves. Jewish people, if they're not humble, are, uh, they'll tell you a thing or two. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will what? So he's trying to tell these Jewish believers, listen, you're going about it all wrong. You're doing what you used to do. You're freaking out. You're calling people's names. You're compromising. You're murdering others. You just don't, you're just freaked out. Stop it. Hello? Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and then he'll lift you up. Prayer. Get back to prayer, people. He's saying, Jewish people, get in your prayer. You know, seek God. All right, a couple of points. Number one, submit to God. Where? All the time. When? First thing in the morning. You won't have to resist the devil. He will, dry, he will drive him completely away because when you submit to God, you're getting soaked with light. Soaked with the presence of God, too. Remember the Jewish mindset. 
They thought they were cool just because they were the Jews. And folks, read the Bible. You might say, well, you're just picking on, are you one of those anti-Jewish people? Are you kidding me? I've been to Israel. How about you? I love them. The problem is everybody in the flesh is not fit to be with God. That's why we're not taking this flesh with us. Stay out of it. Can you say amen? And it doesn't matter what nationality you are. Japanese or Chinese too. Get out of the flesh. Follow God from your heart. Say amen somebody. All right. Now Jesus, one of the first sermons he ever preached to his disciples was how God strips a person down in the flesh and builds them up in the spirit. Everyone say, wow. I didn't know that. Matthew chapter 5. Let's look at it with you. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, And seeing the multitude, Jesus immediately went down to the multitude. No, he turned around and went up into a mountain. And when he was seated, I mean, what are you, what are you doing, Jesus? Well, he's going to go pray and talk to his father about all these people. And when he was seated, the disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, now, the Greek says that Jesus kept teaching him. Remember he said to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you really love me? You see, remember that time in the scripture? That's how Jesus taught this. So he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. D Denise, blessed are the poor in spirit. Do you know what I'm talking about? Blessed are the poor in spirit. And that's how he began to teach his disciples. Now remember, he's not talking to the multitude. He's talking to his team members. And he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall, or theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The word blessed means happy and totally, completely fulfilled are those who come to the end of their self and depend on God. That's what that first scripture means. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. God says the kingdom is yours. You're going to walk with Jesus. Two, blessed are those that mourn. Mourning breaks your flesh. One of the ways of fasting, they call it mourning. So a person that flesh is hardened won't mourn at all. In fact, will make fun of people when bad happens to them. But a person that has a mourning part of their flesh is soft. They cry. They, they weep. They mourn because the flesh is that one thing that can harden our heart towards God. So blessed are those, complete are those that know how to mourn, for they shall be comforted. The moment you start to mourn because of the, the corruption in the world, God starts to comfort you. So he's telling his disciples, look, you're mourning after all of this junk. Half of the, the nation, more than half of the nation of Israel Reject the Messiah. I'm sitting here teaching you. Mourn. Weep for Jerusalem. The lament for their children. The women, they get suck during those times because they rejected their Messiah. Wow, we need to know these things. So when you get some happy Christian who wants to be Jewish, come floating your way, you look at him saying, you need to go back and study the Bible. God says somebody like you don't know what you believe, and so the enemy is just flopping you back and forth. Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament. And you're sick, you're frustrated, and you don't know what to think. That's how that works. And who do you think's behind that? You bet. Get out of that. And third thing he says is, blessed are the meek. He didn't say weak, meek. Meek means having tremendous strength, but only using enough. Blessed are you when you use enough of my power to get the job done. Then it says, for yours is what? Well, you shall inherit the earth. Folks, what happens after the millennium? The earth is turned back over to Jesus and us. The devil's gotten rid of and everything's gone. It's renovated by fire. And God rebuilds it, puts us in it. We reign happily ever after. And we're going to explore all that places out there in the universe that God won't let us go because we have a devil in our flesh. 
All right, moving past that. All right, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. How about you? Do you hunger and thirst after righteousness? First thing you open up after you pray is your Bible? I hope so. It's too, too short of time now for you to be fooling around with your PDA and your, your phone. Come on. It's quiet in here. Now, unless you're looking through Scripture that way now. Amen. I mean, those little gadgets are designed to spin your head and get you all goobered up. You're either in charge of that thing, or if it's controlling you, then throw it away. Something with it. Get your face back in the real book. And then it goes, blessed are the merciful. So you notice the first part is the stripping away and the ascending. Blessed are the Come to the end of themselves, the mourn, the meek, and the hunger and thirsting. And now it's a descending. Our spirit now is ascending, so blessed are meek. After all of the first part, blessed are those that what? Are merciful. Amen. Have you ever had a chance to see mercy work through you? Just remember where God took you from and what he's forgiven you, and maybe mercy will operate a little better. Blessed are the merciful, for they obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, those that seek God, choose God, and know him. For they shall see God. <laughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The word see there has a bigger meaning. It means to perceive, understand God. Okay? And then nine, blessed are the uh, peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Then you know what our reward is? Now that we're like Jesus, now Jesus took more time to explain it to him. After all that's done, gentlemen, you'll be like me, and number 10 is going to be your benefit. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He says, boys, if you go back down from walking with me, thinking that you're going to overcome the world, you're going to name it and claim it, you're going to do all this for yourself, it isn't going to work. Because the first thing that's going to happen when you become like Jesus is they're going to hate you because they hated me. So once you get that down, when they start calling you names and doing all that kind of stuff, you just smile and say, hey, you're just biblical. You're doing what's in the Bible. I am? I don't want to be doing that. Well, then join me. Let's go ahead and have a relationship with God. Say amen. Remember, we have the upper hand. We don't have to prove anything to anyone. And any time you need, God will step up and prove himself as you're talking about him to others. You just have to believe for it. It's happened to me thousands, of, countless thousands of times. I'll stop and say, God's touching you right now. The power of God it just hit him. You got to know how to follow God and flow that way. And we, get, we learn that by being with God. Say amen, somebody. All right. So here we go. So then it says, blessed are you persecuted. Now, let's drop down James 4, chapter 11 through 13. Don't judge a brother or a sister. Can you say amen? Well, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible about not judging, isn't there? Why do you suppose it's in there? Because it's one of Satan's tools. Okay, look at what it says, verse 11. Do not speak evil of one another. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> Brethren, he who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother, speaks evil of the law, judges the law. Now remember this Jewish mindset. So they understood that phrase. They knew if they were guilty of breaking the law, they're subject possibly to death. So the last thing a Jewish person wants to do is break the law or to insult God about the law. So here, here, Pastor James says, look, you're going to judge your brother? You're judging the law. You're not a doer of the law, but a judge. Verse 12, there is one lawgiver, that's Father, and one is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? Say amen, everybody. All right, a couple of points under that. Number one, don't speak evil of one another. Just make a decision to ask God to help you. He who speaks evil against a brother, you're speaking evil even on yourself. 
judges a brother, speaks evil against the law, and if you're Jewish, that means trouble. Second of all, you are in trouble. You bring condemnation down upon yourself. And who, who are we to judge another brother? We'll all stand before God, given the account of our life. Now, you're not going to stand before God if you're not born again. But if you're born again, you're going to stand before God. And let me explain quickly. We're almost out of time. Is everything that you've done, good or bad, in the flesh or in the spirit, not sin, but whether you could have or should have and you didn't, whether you should, you could have done it more and you didn't, all is going to come before the Lord. So let's say if you've got an attitude and God tells you, I want you to do this, but you've got a whole attitude because some of the people don't appreciate what you're doing, then you're not going to get an award for anything as long as you've got that attitude. No, you're not going to get a bleh. Sit down and ask God to give you a right spirit and do it with the right mind and with the right attitude. Then you'll get rewards. It says you'll even, if you give a glass of water to another prophet or another Christian, you'll receive. You won't lose your reward. But then we go out and say, I got an usher today. Bless God. Now sit down. You won't get no rewards. You get an attitude against somebody and you do it anyway, you're not going to get a thing for it. And God will probably make you do it anyway. <laughs> and you'll get a, a thing for it. And not only that, you'll have a bad attitude the whole time you do it. I watch people just lose rewards day after day after two because they won't go to God and get their self adjusted. Say amen, somebody. So don't judge your brother. <laughs> Got another scripture that tells us about it. It's in Romans chapter 2. I'll read it real quickly. And we only got a little more scripture and we're done. Romans 2, 1 through 3. Let me just read it to you. Romans 2, 1 through 3. Remember this when we study the book of Romans. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are that judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to the truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O oh man, ye who judge those practicing such things and doing the same things yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? You see, they knew that. And even in Romans, they're talking to the Jewish people because one of the things God said, hey, you know. So back to James 4, 13 through 17, and this is the end. Don't take tomorrow for granted. Hello. Oh, yeah, I'll be at church next week. Hey, you better pray and ask God. Maybe he has something for you to do. Oh, let's go have lunch. Hello. People do that a lot. So let's see what James, Pastor James says about it. Come now, you who say, tomorrow, today or tomorrow, we will do such and such in a city. Spend a year there, buy and sell, make a profit. You know, it's okay to make goals, folks. But better consult with the one you have in your heart. So whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even like a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this and do that. But now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it is sin. Hello. If you know to love your brother and yet you hate him, you're a sinner. And if you keep on that way, you're going to be in huge trouble. See, it isn't the fact that we make mistakes. It isn't the fact that we, we blow it and we do things like that. It's the fact that we continue to do them. That causes the trouble. Amen? Listen, there's a way that seems right unto a man. But the end thereof is the way of death. Okay? Sometimes the way we do things is not the right way. And it seems like God is pulling nails to get our attentions about it. We need to do it his way. God doesn't want to change our personalities. He simply wants us to make us better. 
Hello. I can look at a person and watch them work. And then I can give them a readout and tell them how to do everything better. They will resent me for that. And yet, if they did it, they would praise me for that. That's what God wants to do to our life. He wants us to be able to work better, smarter, faster if we need to work, to enjoy life fuller. But we need his advice and his wisdom to do that very thing because sometimes we're just concentrating too hard and it's taking too long to do too little of a something. If it takes you an hour to do 10 minutes of a job, you're, you're hanging out with the Israelites. 11-day journey took them 40 years. Get out of your head, serve God from your heart. Amen. Get out of your head, serve God from your heart. Amen. Stop thinking you're all this. Get into here and be humble, 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 humble. What would you like me to do? How can I do this? What are the steps I need to take? How can I, what color do you want it? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Just ask him. Get, get really involved in God. Can you say amen? All right, the Lord bless you. Keep you tonight. We just had a good time on the word. But this, Pastor James, he's talking to these people. These people's lives were ruined. They were just coming apart. They had it made, being Jewish people in Jerusalem, till the Roman people took over. And man, now all the problems started. And for years, they started becoming phonier and phonier and phonier. And less and less into God, more into what they're doing for God. And here's a little key. If what you do for God takes up your time from God, then stop doing it. What you do for God takes your time from God. Then you're out of balance. What do you mean? If your prayer life doesn't sustain what you do, with what you're doing, and you have no prayer life, you're out of balance. Don't get out there and do things for Jesus and you have no prayer life. Hello. Because you're going to fail and Satan's going to mop the floor with you and embarrass you and make Christianity look bad. And we have a whole bunch of yahoos out there telling everybody and correcting everybody and they don't got an idea what they're saying. You need to get back to the Bible and find out how God wants them to be in these last days. Say amen, everyone.